Thanks, everybody. We have a great audience today, and it's my first PyCon. Uh, so yeah, I would like to give you a warning first. Uh, I'm a really bad Python coder, so don't get seriously whatever I say in the talk. And there will be some C++ in there. Sorry about that in advance. Uh, so yeah, I call myself an astro coder. Uh, pretty much, I just like to code software for uh, astronomy. Um, I would say that uh, I am a, more of a computer scientist. I have background on programming of video games, uh, computer graphics, scientific visual visualization, and so on. And uh, about seven years ago, I said, why not do a PhD in astronomy? And this is what I did. Uh, and since then, I have some expertise on most, mostly on galaxies and processing astronomical data. Um, as I said, uh, I'm really bad in Python, and um, I'm a C++ fanboy, I would say. Uh, so why I'm here today? Uh, I would like to talk about uh, a software that I wrote when I was in my PhD. Uh, I wrote it in C++, and last year I ported it into Python. Uh, and I would like to share my experience and my thoughts. Uh, it's a software for galaxy kinematic, kinematic modeling. So now, if you don't know what this means, do not worry. Uh, in five minutes, you're going to be experts in um, galaxy kinematic modeling, actually. Uh, so we we'll start with galaxies. What is a galaxy? A galaxy is just a, a system with um, uh, stars, gas, uh, dark matter, and dust, uh, all together gravitationally bound. Um, a simple, uh, a, a typical, let's say, picture of a spiral or disk galaxy uh, is that of uh, a disk that might have some kind of um, um, arms. Uh, we have uh, a bulge at the center, it can be a, a, a sphero, like a like a sphere, or it can be more like a like a bar. Uh, we have this stellar halo. Uh, that has some older stars, and there is also the dark matter halo that you cannot see here because it's dark matter, but it's around the galaxy. Uh, some facts about galaxies, they come in different uh, shapes and styles. We have, if, if, but if you want to categorize them in two, ba two main categories, you could say that you have the very boring and not fun ellipticals and the very interesting spirals. Um, now, galaxies have plenty of stars. Now you're looking at uh, 100... Uh, million stars at the Andromeda galaxy, part of the Andromeda galaxy. And they can be quite big. Uh, so for example, Milky Way is that speck on the bottom left. Um, uh, so as you can see, yeah, they can actually be quite big. Uh, so now if you want to see one and you don't have a telescope and so on, uh, don't worry, just go far away from the city and look up, you know, surprise. Um, so at this point, you're all experts uh, with galaxies. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we're going to, uh, now in a, another two minutes, you're going to be experts in galaxy kinematics. Uh, so what do we mean by galaxy kinematics? Uh, we mean the, the motions of uh, stars, gas, and dust in galaxies. And um, why, why it is important, why we want to study that? This is because whatever, many of the things that happened in the past or are currently happening in the, the galaxy, they are imprinted in its kinematics. So by studying the kinematics, we can actually learn more about galaxies. Uh, so in order to understand galaxy kinematics, the first thing you need to know is the Doppler effect. Uh, many of you uh, experience it every day. So you have a source that emits like a, a sound wave. When the source is coming towards you, you can actually hear the, you know, the, the frequency increasing. And when the source goes away from you, you can actually hear the frequency you know, decreasing. Um, so the same thing happens with light. Uh, so let's say you, you have a light source, maybe that's a star in a galaxy uh, far away or not very far away. Uh, and, uh, and this light uh, come, you know, begins from the galaxy and comes to Earth and goes through some, through some gas and stuff. And when it arrives on Earth, uh, we analyze the light, we extract its spectrum, and we notice those spectral lines. And we notice that uh, those spectral lines are actually not where they're supposed to be. And this is because apparently that galaxy was moving. So for the parts of the galaxy that are moving uh, towards us, uh, we, we observe a shift on the wavelength. So it, the, the light becomes bluer. Uh, and for the other parts that are coming, uh, going away from us, the light becomes redder. Quite simple. Uh, so at the end of the day, when we observe a galaxy, we, uh, we get this thing called the spectral data cube, which pretty much is uh, the spectrum of the galaxy on its spatial position on the sky. 
And from that, we can create other data products. Uh, for example, we can squash everything together and get the total light of the galaxy in every special position. Uh, we can extract uh, the so-called velocity map, which shows the line of sight velocity uh, of its special position uh, on the sky. And of course, the uh, velocity dispersion map, which shows how much the radial velocity varies at that special position. Uh, so now you're experts in uh, astronomical spectroscopy. And uh, we're going to explain what is galaxy kinematic modeling. So galaxy kinematic modeling is, um, is the process of fitting a model to some galaxy observation in order to extract some properties of that galaxy. Uh, so it goes like this. Uh, you, you infer a model. That model has a series of parameters that describe the galaxy. Uh, and then you guess some parameters at the start or either based on some prior or just randomly. And then you evaluate your model using those parameters. Uh, then you, let's say, subtract the, the model from uh, the data and you check the residuals. You, know, you assess how good the fit is. If the fit is not good, you adjust the model parameters using optimization technique and you repeat that again and again. At, at, and at some point, you get to a set of parameters that is good enough. When that, uh, what ha that happens, you just return the, best, the current best fit parameters and you do your science. And that's it. Uh, so everybody now is an expert on galaxy kinematic modeling. So let's see the challenges. Uh, there are some challenges that come with galaxy kinematic modeling. Uh, actually, we are at the beginning of an era of a large scale specially resolved spectroscopy uh, era. That means that uh, we have these uh, scientific programs that they observe uh, the sky, either uh, the entire sky or big parts of the sky, and they essentially observe a lot of galaxies. We're going to have or we are having thousands of galaxies coming and uh, we expect to, to observe a, um, a very diverse, uh, let's say, uh, sample of galaxies that will have different kinematics and different mor morphologies. And of course, we expect that we will need uh, enormous computational uh, you know, power in order to process this data. So what do we need is software that is flexible enough to describe the diversity of galaxies in the universe, but also we need software that is fast enough to complete the analysis in a reasonable amount of time. To have an idea of the, the diversity in the universe, this is just a few galaxies. You can actually see that all of them, they're just different, either their kinematics or their uh, morphology, on different wavelengths, of, on different distances from the Earth, and so on. And in order to get a better understanding on how computationally hungry is the process of modeling, uh, here I have cited a few papers that uh, they, were, they are actually software release papers for, from other software for galaxy kinematics. And as you can see, uh, in some cases, the process just for one galaxy can take you know, hours, days, or sometimes it's so prohibitive that you won't even you know, think of running the modeling. Uh, so what I did, I, took a, I created a table with all the popular software for galaxy kinematics and uh, I tried to somehow assess them on, based on some metrics. You don't need to understand what are those metrics, but actually you can see the problem here. Uh, and the problem is that uh, no software excels uh, on all areas. And actually this makes sense because astronomers, uh, usually all the software actually, uh, it's written for a particular project, it's written for a particular uh, kind of instrument, or it's written to, uh, for a particular paper. So each software was focusing on a particular area. There is no, uh, let's say, generic software that can actually handle any kind, all, all the cases. Uh, and that was actually my motivation behind writing uh, the latest version of GBK Fit on, on Python. So before talking, I started talking about GBK Fit. I would like to uh, state some facts here. Uh, are there any astronomers in the audience? Uh, okay, there are some astronomers. Just try to keep an open mind. It's just exaggerations. Um, so yeah, first of all, astronomers are astronomers, which means that they do not necessarily have. Uh, training on, you know, uh, software engineering or parallel processing. Uh, although, having that said, the late years, uh, because, of, because astronomy has become a data, data science problem, we have more and more computer scientists jumping on the astronomy train. Um, and because we're astronomers, we tend to focus on papers over software. We care about writing papers because this is what we are paid off, I guess. 
Uh, and, uh, and as a result, we don't care much about you know, uh, writing the most shiny software, the most awesome software. Uh, you know, we don't follow conventions. I mean, PEP8, what, what is this thing? I don't know. Uh, so, and also we, we tend to use extremely outdated software. Uh, you know, if it works once, or if it can produce the plot we want for the paper, we will use that until, you know, forever. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can guess that uh, it's, it's very hard for us to use parentheses next to, next to our print statement. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, those are the, some facts. Um, so now, uh, if we go back, when I started my PhD, I was about to start writing uh, GBK Fit, and uh, you know, a colleague of mine asked, you know, what language are you going to use? Um, and indeed, there are some uh, popular languages in astronomy uh, for good reasons. Uh, so I started, I investigated a few languages. First of all, I started with uh, Fortran. Um, Fortran is a great language for scientific, <laughs> uh, I know, right? Um, a great language for scientific and numerical applications, but it's kind of old. It's actually very old, for, but it's still used for reasons that I'm not going to get into now. Uh, and, and because it's old, I don't think it's a good choice for a new project. Uh, but regardless, I want to thank Fortran for its service. Uh, and then continue to the next language, which is IDL. Um, maybe you don't know this language, it's mostly used in, on science. Apparently, it's not free, you have to pay for it. And that was the good thing, because it only took me one minute to decide that you know, I don't want to actually work with this language. <laughs> Uh, and um, then uh, my, my friend was like, oh, wait, what about, uh, George, what about uh, Python, you know? I mean, I don't need to tell you how cool Python is, right? So you, you all know, uh, you know, what a great language it is. Um, and what I want to highlight maybe is that, you know, astronomers, because they, they want to spend the minimum amount of time on writing code, they like to prototype. They like to, uh, you know, write something really fast and, you know, just publish their paper. Um, so the, uh, Python looks like a great language. Um, however, uh, I replied to my colleague, you know, is that thing very slow? Uh, I guess I was, you know, I was uh, very uh, ignorant, uh, arrogant, and self-righteous at that point. I had no experience with Python before, uh, and um, unfortunately, I rejected uh, that language. And uh, for me, it was a, at that point, it was a no-brainer to go with C++ just because it's an established language, language and I already had uh, about uh, eight years of experience. Um, so that was uh, okay, everything was fine, I guess. So I developed the first version of GBK Fit, which is a high-performance software for galaxy kinematic modeling. Uh, it was running on CPUs and GPUs. I was using this thing called CMake to uh, try to you know deploy it a bit easier and compile it a bit easier, um, and there were a few papers out that doing science with uh, that software, uh, you know all great. However, well there were some problems. Uh, the problem first of all is that when I started my PhD, I was just a computer scientist, so I had no experience. I mean I didn't know much about astronomy, uh, and. Uh, uh, the, uh, so I, I, wa I wasn't very familiar with uh, the requirements of the software I wanted to write. So I had to actually rewrite it completely two times and do infinite amount of refactors. And believe me, doing that in C++, for me at least, it, it wasn't very pleasant. Uh, and also, I had problem deploying the software. You know, uh, all astronomers and most of the computers, supercomputers I would use, they always had uh, old software, and uh, because I was coming from a computer science kind of background, I would always make sure I'm using the latest standards, and my code would won't actually compile anywhere. Uh, and besides those technical issues, um, the thing is that uh, my modeling requirements changed. What I mean by that, uh, during my PhD, I was working with uh, galaxies that were either uh, very far away, uh, or they were. Um, close by, but they were the data were taken with low resolution instruments. As a result, I would actually resolve those ki uh, kind of objects that um, they feature just simple uh, rotation. And uh, I, my software will use a very simple model to model these uh, galaxies. However, um, when I moved, uh, when I started working for CSIRO here in Sydney, uh, and went into radio astronomy, I had to my disposal uh, high resolution instruments and I was actually uh, working with uh, not very far away uh, galaxies. 
So there, things were, are much different. So I had to deal with a very diverse kind of morphologies and kinematics and so on. So I, I needed a tool that I needed to have a tool that can deal with those uh, these diversities. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to spend a lot of time coding again. Um, so then I, you know, revisited Python. Um, you know, again, you know, it's great language. And at that point in time, I, I had four years of experience because although I haven't been using Python for my main software for GBK Fit, I've been using it for scripting and plotting. Actually, astronomers do almost everything, almost everything with Python nowadays. They're scripting at least, uh, and the plotting. Uh, and also, you know, the, the truth is that Python supports uh, C++ extensions. So if something is very slow, if something is very slow, I can just write an extension and, you know, everything will be just fine. And, uh, okay, then I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's actually rewrite the entire thing in Python. And uh, since then, my life was just great. Everything was <laughs> going just great. And uh, you know something, it's, it's those little, uh, yes, uh, sorry, you missed the picture. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's those uh, very uh, little things that made my life uh, easier. Maybe you find them silly, but for me, you know, having JSON included in language is great. Uh, because, uh, you know, otherwise I had to have drag a dependency with me and uh, manage that. And because the complexity of GB Fit, of the new version of GBK Fit, uh, I, when I'm using uh, text data for kind of metadata, uh, I need to use some more structured kind of file format, and JSON was exactly the right format for this job. So I'll just do import JSON, everything was fine. And there were many others, like small things like, you know, f-strings. Uh, dictionaries are part of the core part of the language. You can do hacks. Well, I tell them hacks are people who, with more experience is something that they do anyway. Uh, the, uh, you can just print everything in Python immediately if you want you know, to see a value of something. You can do that in C++ as well, but you have to write a few lines. Why would you have to write those few lines? And there are other things like uh, you know, arc parse and, and so on. And then there are the bigger things. Um, I guess we, most of you are familiar with NumPy. I won't, I'm not going to cover it, uh, but you know, just keep in mind that NumPy is one of the I think it's the most used library in astronomy, Python library in astronomy. Uh, and keep in mind that, you know, um, NumPy is not, uh, it doesn't take advantage of all the cores of the CPU usually. And this we will come back uh, later actually. But other than that, when it, it's actually quite efficient because it's pretty much C at the end of the day. Uh, other libraries I've been using is uh, AstroPy. Uh, has, everything you need for astronomy like literally everything it's uh if you look at the code you're just i mean when i look at the code i feel bad about myself because it's so great uh and you know i use astropy to load my observations uh, i use uh, scipy to do some pre-processing on the data using the imaging processing libraries it has um, and uh, of course i'm like a typical astronomer of course i'm using matplotlib to uh, plot out my results um so now, uh, as I said before, you know, kinematic modeling, uh, pretty much uh, you have three main blocks. You have your model that you fit to the data with the help of an optimizer. As I said, the, the data is, uh, how I deal with the data is pretty, uh, from a Python point of view is that, as I said, I use JSON just to read all the metadata and I use AstroPy to uh, read my observations. And that those are like, like five lines of code or something. Um, then I would like to actually talk a bit about the models. The model is essentially uh, a simulated galaxy observation. Uh, it's essentially a 2D or a three-dimensional array. And the way it's implemented in GBK Fit is that the core code of GBK Fit knows nothing about the models. So this way I can support as many models as I want. I can add new models without actually breaking anything. Uh, and, um, and each model has to let's say conform to a particular, you know, it has to be uh, derived from this uh, G model or galaxy model uh, class. You can actually ignore the left and right uh, snippets and just focus on the center. Uh, so now the, all, the, the, all the, uh, the code for the galaxy models on GBK Fit are pure Python with one exception. And that one exception is the, the evaluate function inside there I tend to call C++ code, I tend to call a C++ extension to make sure that I do the, you know, the evaluation of the model as fast as possible. Um, yes, uh, so 
some, okay, now I have some C++, so sorry about that. Uh, this is uh, a very simple code of, you know, um, evaluating a, a model. Um, so here it's just a simple, as you can see, we have two loops and then we have just pure mathematical computations and at the end I just save the results to a, an array and that thing produces the, this image at the top right. Uh, now if I, in C++, now if I want to parallelize this, because I need to parallelize it because otherwise it's very slow, Ta -da! I just add one line and now it runs in all the cores of my CPU. If, if I want more stuff, if I want to put on a GPU, I just use the latest version of OpenMP and that's it. Um, if I want to do it on a, a go lower level to use CUDA, I just you know, remove the loops because uh, the CUDA runtime will provide them for me and everything else is the same. As you can see, every, or the code is the exact same. So I can support many different uh, architectures with just uh, you know, change, like minor changes. Um, and then I was like, okay, maybe, uh, okay, that's all good, but still I have to have uh, the C++ extension, I have to do this black magic on the setup tools, my setup.py, which I still don't know how it works, but I just put things together and eventually it works. Uh, maybe just you know, put, do everything in Python to get rid of that. Um, so first I was like, okay, let's start, take the single core uh, C++ code and port it to Python. Loops in Python, it works, but as you can guess, it's very slow. Okay, maybe we should use uh, NumPy in the right way, which is, you know, everything is a vector, we apply operations on vectors. That works, that is actually faster than the single core C++ version. Um, however, you know, um, since you're working on vectors, you usually allocate more memory than you, you would need usually. Um, so there was a, then I was like, okay, but I want to use all the CPUs uh, on, my, on my machine. Well, you can use Numba. You just, uh, so Numba, pretty much, uh, it's a just-in-time compiler. It will compile this to more native code during the runtime. You do that by just, you know, adding a decorator and replacing your uh, range function with number p range, and that's it. That will give me the same performance with the C++ multi-threaded multi uh, version. Uh, and then, if you want to do it on a GPU, uh, uh, you decorate with number.cuda.zit. You don't have new loops anymore because they're provided by CUDA, and that's it. Um, then, of course, you have to do some setup. You know, transfer your memory from CPU to GPU. Well, it's, but it's it's quite trivial. Um, and then um, another approach is to use a CuPy or QPy or whatever it's called. Uh, in that case, you take your NumPy code and you just replace Kupai, uh, NumPy with CuPy and everything runs on the GPU. Fantastic. Now, if you want, uh, however, because as I, as I said before, when you're working like in a vector fashion, like in a NumPy style, uh, you tend to um, waste more memory. So if you use big models, this will actually crash because you don't have enough memory usually on the GPU. So what you do then, you use CuPy with, uh, you take your uh, pure CUDA code and you use, the, use it with CuPy after doing some initialization. Fine. Uh, so now, I, I said many things and which one is better? I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, C++ extensions have a, a wider support for hardware. Numba is easier to write. Uh, C++ and CuPy can reuse the same code. And Numba and Numba CUDA can reuse the same code. For now, I'm using C++ extensions, but I don't know if that would be forever. Um, just a few words uh, about now the other block of uh, GBK Fit. Uh, it's the optimizer. Um, as I said, the optimizer is used to uh, control to um, adjust the model parameters when you do the fitting. Uh, so it directly controls the number of evaluations and indirectly the, the runtime of the fitting procedure. Uh, people tend to use them as black boxes, which is not always uh, a great idea, but you know, if it works, it's fine, I guess. Uh, and um, the, the problem is that it's, it's not trivial to, trivial to write an optimizer. So for me, it was very important that I have to reuse, to use a third-party library for the optimizer. Uh, and uh, for GBK Fit 1, um, I had two optimization strategies. Uh, they worked well, uh, but uh, they had some issues. I mean, the main issue is that they were just plain tarballs on a website that I had to download and copy into my project in some cases, or one of them 
multi-nest at least they pro it provide the CMake, so it uh, build script and install script that will make things a bit easier. But again, those actually were the best solution solutions at that point in time. Then, if you do a like a quick search about MCMC, that we you know we, uh, now you're also MCMC experts since it was covered in the previous talks. Um, if you do a quick search uh, on from using a uh, Python and C++, you'll see that. Uh, the number of libraries, the MCMC libraries for Python are way more than C++. Actually in C++, the three results I have there, two are not even relevant. So by moving to Python, I had to my disposal more optimization techniques. And it's not like I just like to add more optimization techniques. The truth is that each optimization technique is just unique. It serves a particular purpose. So there's not such thing as a, you know, the best optimizer. Uh, and uh, as a result, I usually say that uh, GBG Fit version 2 supports N optimizers because, you know, it supports so many of them. And, you know, to add an optimizer to the system, of course, you have to extend uh, the fitter class and implement the particular function. So, uh, how did we do after all that? Um, now we can say that uh, we can tick all the boxes with a new version of GBG Fit. And if you remember the beginning of my talk when I mentioned the runtimes of other software from hours to days to never, uh, here I have similar models, high resolution models with uh, very peculiar kinematics or irregular morphologies. And I was able to actually fit that uh, in from one to 10 minutes, which is quite you know, encouraging. Now, if you're asking you know, where is that software, can I use it? Uh, well, um, I, public release soon. I've been saying that for uh, three months now. Uh, I, I need to do some cleanup, you know, all the, all the boring stuff, uh, you know, write documentation, for example. Uh, and there's also a paper that I have to uh, write uh, uh, at the same time. Um, and now, actually, I guess I can conclude with pictures. So here the main point is that um, in the past, using the first version of GBK Fit, I was able to model very simple galaxies, very simple rotating galaxies, and that would li limit me to the amount of science I could do. But now, with the new version of GBK Fit that is written in Python, um, I can actually model way more peculiar and diverse kinematics and morphologies of galaxies, and uh, it's, uh, it's Python to thank for that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. So, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Um, yeah. You can find me later on at, you know, at the, you know, after the talk. <laughs> Do a small present for, for appreciation oh. of speaking. Thank you and, very much. Yeah, we hope to see you around for the later talks today.